We're in 3.1. We had just left off talking about the Mayans and their numeration system, so let's pick back up where we left off with them. Um, we had encountered a system that is written instead of left to right. It's written top to bottom or bottom to top. Um, the largest values are the top, the smallest values at the bottom. Dots are one, horizontal lines are five, and we have the shell shape that's a zero. Um, it's a modified base 20 system, so it means that they have place values of base 20, kind of. Um, their third place value, instead of being 20 squared, is actually 20 times 18, and then powers of 20 go up from there. We haven't actually seen that in play very much, but we've done this one example where we looked at what comes before and what comes after. So the number coming before just removed a dot from the bottom, and the number coming after put an, put an extra dot on the bottom, which turned the four dots into five dots, which created a line. Does that sound like what we remember from where we left off? Now, the problem is that when this happens, as in the case of the example that we're using, we've created something that isn't necessarily um, you know, the same number we thought we were creating. It, it's right, we didn't do anything wrong, but if you think about what value is represented here, it also looks like it could be something else. So this one right here, I'll copy it to the next slide. I didn't mean cut. Let's try that again. If you just saw this from the get-go, what number might you believe that this is actually worth? 17. But that's not the number that we intended it for it to be. Intended for it to be. We intended it intended for it to be the number that came after something that was 7 times 20. Good grief, I keep drawing random lines today. 7 in the 20 spot and 9 in the 1 spot, and that's well over 17 already, right? I have 720s. Imagine having like seven twenty dollar bills. Uh, that's, that's more than $17, right? So there's some confusion in this, and that's not ideal. <clears throat> so this could be interpreted like this. Um, it also could be interpreted that each of these are a different place value. That actually can happen all the time with Mayan. When we're looking at place values, we're going to simply draw the line between that red line that I drew between, between places where the lines go downward into dots. That guarantees a place value change. But there's nothing that says that it couldn't possibly have a place value change between any vertical pairing. So perhaps there's actually a value that's supposed to have a line here. Good grief. Here. And maybe there's one, maybe there's a whole bunch of place value separations and we just can't sort of see them, right? There's no way to distinguish. So if we did that, we would have a two in one place and it's four places up. So that is actually 20 squared times 18. Um, and then there's a, I didn't mean 20 there. I meant two there. Let's make that smaller. Um, there's a 5 in the next one. That's the 20 times 18 place. So this is another option. Um, there's a 5 in the 20s place. And there's a 5 in the 1s place. And we could add all this together and we would get a large number, a very large number. So there's this ambiguity feature with what's going on here that we don't really have a good way to distinguish. Um, at best, you could say, well, maybe... Maybe you'd like space them out if they were supposed to change place values. And maybe you would, but how do you know how much of a space counts, right? What, what's big enough to say for sure that it changed and what's small enough to say for sure that it didn't? It's a very mysterious kind of thing. So we're going to take that value that we originally began with, um, the number that looked like, oh, I didn't actually have it on that screen. I had it over here. Two dots in a line and then four dots in a line. So we had the two dots and a line, four dots and a line, and we had identified that this is representative seven, this is representative nine. And we're gonna figure out what this number would have actually been in our system. So the first place value down here, this is the ones place, and then I've got the twenties place. So it takes seven times 20 plus one, I'm sorry, five, five, nine, nine, times 1. So this is 140, and I've got another 9. I've got a 149. So if we're turning this number into our system, we're multiplying by different 
place values in the powers of 20 or modified base 20. This is our third number system. Last time we did Egyptian and then we did Babylonian and we paused in the middle of doing Mayan. So when we did Babylonian, we encountered this um, division algorithm. I'll show it to you right here, where we divided by the powers or the, the values that were the powers of 60, right? We figured out what are some of the powers of 60, how big of a power of 60 do I need, and then we divided by all of them. Does that sound like familiar? Okay. We're going to do the same thing with the Mayans. The Mayans have this modified base 20 system. So as we said, this is the ones place, then you have 20, and then you have 20 times 18, which is 360. And you have 20 squared times 18. So what is 20 squared times 18? Let me grab a calculator if you need it. 20 squared times 18. You'll want your calculator out from other things later today anyway, so if you don't have it out, now's a good time to grab it. Mm -hmm. And then if we needed to go up another one, we'd have 20 cubed times 18. What's that one? <coughs> yeah, 144,000. Um, and 144,000 is actually bigger than the 58,000 we're starting with, right? So this 144,000, we won't need this one. It's just too big. But the ones beneath it are all values that are smaller than the 50, 58,000 that we're working with. So we are going to use them. Okay, does everybody understand why I marked out 144,000? Okay, so it's always a good idea to go at least one bigger to see for sure that you've encountered all that you need. So that's what we did. And then 7,200 or 7,200 is where we're going to go back to. So if that's 7,200 and I make this, I don't know, this algorithm, this, this shape that looks like a top hat, um, I put the number I'm dividing inside of the hat or under the house, right? 558,532. And I want to know how many times 7,200 or 7,200 goes into it. So you can literally do a division. It's just that we want only the whole number piece that comes out of the division of your calculator. So if I take 58,532 and divide by 7,200, what's the whole number part? Eight. And we put the eight over here on the right-hand side of the top hat. Okay. Then we're going to multiply that eight by 7,200. 57,600. Okay. So we put that underneath and we subtract. So what is 58,532 minus 57,600? Okay, looks good. So everybody good so far? See where all the pieces came from? Okay, and we just go down this line. So we, we divided by the 7,200. Now we're going to divide by 360. 360 is our next piece. How many 360s are there in 932? There are two. And 2 times 360 is 720. 720. If I subtract, what do I get? 212. What's the next thing I'll divide by? 20. 20. Go down the list. 20 is the next one. So how many 20s are there in 212? 10. Mm -hmm. 10 times 20 is? I'm going to finish that up. Kaylee, what's next if we subtract? You're doing a great job. 12, uh-huh. Then what? One. One and 12. And that subtracts the 12 to give us the zero. So we've divided by each of the powers in their place value system all the way down to one. Okay? So the answer over here is very literally 8, 2, 10, 12. It's just that it's not in their symbols yet. It's, it, this, this one's very, very nice because, because it's written you know, vertically. These are the numbers that correspond to the values that we want. That's exactly what they are. We just need to write 8 in their symbols and 12, a 2 in their symbols and so forth. 
So what would 8 be written as in their symbols? Line and three dots, and the dots are always on top of the line. Okay, so a line and three dots. How about the two? Two dots. Two dots. Ten? Two lines. Two lines. Twelve? Two lines and two dots. Two lines and two dots. This is our answer, and it is correct, but it is also confusing. It's confusing but because it, it really looks like that we have twelve here twice, doesn't it? But we didn't. We had a place value break. Our place value break was actually right here, but there's nothing in this system to separate them in to actually indicate there was a place value break there. And that's obviously not ideal. Right? So it has that sort of innate flaw in what's going on. Again, any of the problems you do, any of the problems you're reporting back to, if this is the answer, you're done. You're not asked to say, you know, like, but it's terribly confusing. You don't have to do that. Um, but I just want you to understand that there's a flaw, and this is the flaw that's going on right here. All right, let's do our last system. This one you have some familiarity with. Roman numerals. Where have you seen Roman numerals used? There's lots of places, so tell me something. Clocks. In fact, uh, the clock on top of Rayleigh Chapel has Roman numerals on it. Where else? Does anybody use outlines anymore? Have you ever seen outlines used with Roman numerals? Oh, in high, in high school. Yeah, usually in some kind of an English setting, right, or a history setting, perhaps, depending. Um, outlines use um, use Roman numerals. If I had any gentlemen in the class, they would say something like the Super Bowl. They like to write the Super Bowl um, in terms of Roman numeral symbols for what Super Bowl number we're on. Um, you see it with the Olympics sometimes as well. Um, if you travel to the Northeast, right, up to the, you know, Boston and Virginia and that part of the country, you will see buildings uh, with established dates with Roman numerals on them. You'll see tombstones with dates um, of birth dates and death dates with Roman numerals on them. It's very interesting. Um, so my brother-in-law, my husband's brother, got married in... Um, Virginia, and they got married in a church. I can't remember it's where George Washington is buried. Maybe it's Thomas Jefferson. I don't know. It was one of the important people, right? And he was either buried there, he was baptized there, one of these sorts of things or whatever. And the building had Roman numerals on the building. Um, it was very interesting. And on the grave, they, this was a time when um, graveyards were built on the church property. And so there was a graveyard in the church property as well. Same thing with the Roman numerals on there. So they're present in lots of places. Um, we tend to know the Roman numeral values for smaller numbers better than bigger numbers. So these are the Roman numerals that exist. We go I, V, X, L, C, D, M, um, and they each have a value. So you guys know what the I value is. It's one. That, that's one we've seen. How about V? Five. X? Ten. And... If you're working with clocks or if you're working with outlines, you probably don't need anything else than that, right? Usually not. So these other ones are a little bit less familiar to us. Any guesses as to what L might represent? 50. It is 50. Yeah, very good. How about C? It's 100. Do you notice a pattern in the values that are going up here? You should. Based on the pattern, what would D be? Even if you didn't know what D was before now, you probably can see it's now... Nope. Try again. Say it louder, Lisa. It's 500. Kaylee, do you see how they're oscillating 1515 five all the time? Yeah. And they're just I getting longer. The L was 15. I oh, oh, oh. So sorry. Yeah, 50. Uh, how about M? What do you suppose M is? It's 1,000. Yeah. Now, again, you might be left going. Okay, well, we can get to 1,000. I mean, that's, that's better than the Mayans who could only get to five with their single individual digits, right? Or the Babylonians that only had single digits of up to 10, um, you know, for their symbols. This symbol goes higher, but, but still, what happens if a number's bigger than 1,000, right? There's got to be a way to do that that's not just write the 1,000 symbol M out a whole bunch of times, and there is. So the first property 
Um, it's property number two that deals with the bigger than the thousands. But the first property is a property that you're familiar with. It's a subtraction property. Um, the Romans did not write symbols more than three times. Right? So they wouldn't write the symbol four with four eyes. They would write it in a subtraction form. So they put the number I, their num numeral I, before their numeral V, and when the numeral that's smaller came first, you subtracted. And this works for all of their values that would have required them to have three or more symbols. They use a subtraction property. But they only use it for those symbols. So in particular, this only comes into play when you have numbers that are fours and nines. 400, 44, 94. Anything with fours and nines uses a subtraction property. If it's not fours and nines, you're just writing repeated digits like the Egyptians did. Okay? You've got some a little more, more digits that you can use, you know, go from maybe, but you're still writing repeated digits. But it's only if something has fours and nines. So in particular, if you wanted to write 90, you would write... Um, so I, actually, I, I didn't say one thing too. Only I didn't read this. It's on here, but only one value smaller may appear before the larger value. So um, if you're dealing with 90, um, the biggest, the closest value to 90 on this list is what? Let's start with that. Um, C is 100. So yes, it's C. That's the closest value. But we would actually want it to be 10 less than 90. So we put an X, which is their 10 in front of it. Now it's important to note the C here can only have an X in front of it. We cannot, for 99, go, hey, look, 99, the closest value is C, and I'm going to put an I in front of it. Intuitively, that makes sense. It's simply not what they did. So they didn't do this. The I, if you look at it sort of in terms of this, they're, sort of, they're kind of bulking up right here. This I, um, do I want to do it like that? Yeah, I want to do it like that. And then I want to do it like this. And I want to do it like this. The I can only become before a V or an X. The X can only come before an L or a C, and the C can only come before a D or an M. You can't, you can't bring the I down and group it with a C. They're too far apart in their number system. They don't work that way. So what do they do? Well, instead over here, whoops, they would take these numbers and they'd treat them separately. So this is the number much like having 90 plus 9. Okay, well, we just talked about how to get 90. What did we do? XC was 90. And then we put the number 9 in. So how do we get the number 9? Um, so if we did V, we'd have to do V and four I's. So we have to do IX because we don't repeat the number four times. So this is the number I and then X. So XC is the 90, IX is the 9. And again, it doesn't really matter in our minds whether we like it or we don't, whether we think that seems confusing or we don't. We're working in their system and we're using their properties. Does that make sense? Think of it like a cultural situation. If you go somewhere and it's inappropriate to wear a certain item of clothing, it doesn't really matter what you think. If you're going to be appropriate in that culture, you follow that cultural guideline, right? Same idea here. Okay, there's one more property. This one you're probably not as familiar with, and maybe it's the first time you've seen it. This gets us bigger numbers. Um, so if we have a number that is bigger than the number 1,000, and it isn't necessarily just bigger than 1,000, but it's really bigger than, than 3,000 and some change. Because if we have 3,000, we can write three Ms, and that's fine. But if we need 4,000 or bigger, we wouldn't. So we'd need this property. So the multiplication property. So a bar is placed over the Roman numeral, and if, do, if we do that, it multiplies that value by 1,000. If we put a double bar over that numeral, it would be multiplied by a million. So if we wanted to write 9,000, we can't do 9,000 because we would need 9Ms. And we can't do 9Ms. We don't have any bigger symbol. We can't do 9Ms. So when that's the case, in particular, right, if the number is 4,000 or bigger, we're going to sort of break it apart. How do we write the number 9? Y'all know. I -X. I X. That's the number 9. And then the way that we make it worth 9,000 as opposed to just 9 is we put a bar on the top. 
So that bar is treating it almost like a comma does for us. So you can kind of think about it in that way. And again, if we had 9 million, um, write that down like this, we do the same thing in the sense that we would break it apart at the 9. We'd write the 9 as ix, but then we put a double bar on top of it, and that makes it 9 million. That's a pretty clever way to get bigger values. Now, it doesn't go any bigger than the millions place, but to be perfectly honest, have you ever needed to really deal with something bigger than a million anyway? Probably not. Okay, federal government and deficits aside, those are numbers that we don't even work with. They don't even matter to us. So the same thing's true here. A million gets it big enough. Much like the Egyptians, the million was their biggest value too. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at some values. We have the value... MCMX, and the first question is, what number comes before this value? So we always affect the smallest value there. We're not changing it anything yet, but what is the smallest value right here on this number? Where does it, where does it occur? Let's ask it that way first. It occurs at the end, right? The smallest value is at the end. All of our systems have either had the smallest value at the end or with the Mayans, it was at the bottom, right? Smallest value at the end. And that value at the end is what value? It's a 10. So if we're trying to make the value that comes before that, the 10 needs to become a? What comes before 10? Nine. nine. I need that x, the number at the end, to be turned from a 10 into a nine. Well, what does the numeral nine look like? We've only done it twice. I, I x. So everything in the beginning stays the same, MCM. And the 10 at the end becomes a 9, which is IX. That's the number that comes before, because 9 comes before 10. What's the numeral that comes after? How do you get one more than? Yeah, and how would we add one in this system, Mackenzie? You would. You would put a 1 behind the x. So these two look really similar, but the location of the number 1 tells us, am I adding or am I subtracting? In their system, typically it's addition, right? They're adding the pieces together as they go. But when the smaller one comes first before a bigger one, that's when we would subtract in their system. Okay? C says, what is this value that is the original number in the Hindu-Arabic numeration system? So we've got M... C, M, X. And it's a good idea um, to write down what values you have here. So what is M worth? 1,000. 1, C? 100. Not quite. You're getting ahead of me. Just what is C worth? Oh, you said C. C, yeah. Oh, 100. C is worth 100. I've got another M, so that's 1,000. And then my X is the 10. Is that okay with everyone? Just writing down what their actual value that their worth is. Anytime I see a smaller number coming for a larger one, that's subtraction. Do I have that in this problem? I do. What smaller value comes before a larger one here? Yeah, this one right here, right? There's 100 coming before 1,000. So if this smaller comes before the larger, which it does, what is 1,000 minus 100 here? Yep, this is 900. So I have 1,000, I have a 900, and I have 10. So this is 1,910. 1910 looks like a date to me. Okay, now we're going to go back the other direction. And after this, we're going to stop it with a historical, and we're going to look at some manipulatives, okay? All right. Last question in this sort of series of questions. We have the number 1,492,019, and we're going to write it in Roman. Now, clearly this is bigger than 4,000, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly. So I know I'm going to have to break it apart right here. Everybody good with that so far? This number in front of that, is it bigger than 4,000? I don't mean in the original number. I mean as a standalone value, 1,492. No. So I'm not going to break it apart again. I know there's another comma there. 
but we don't just break them apart at commas. We only do it if the number in front of that comma is four or bigger because we're trying to avoid those multiple symbols written out so many times. So we're going to write out the symbols for 1,492 first. That's our first thing. So how do I get 1,000? M. How do I get 400? Yeah, so C is 100, D is 500. So if I write C before D, I have a subtraction feature going on. That is 400. How do I get 90? Um, X and then C. So X is 10 and C is 100. That's another subtraction feature going on. Remember, 4s and 9s subtract. And then 2. I, I. And all of this is before that breaking point where I put that vertical line in there, right? So it's all underneath a bar because it is in the thousands place. It's almost like we have 1492,000, right? We can read it that way. It would be weird. We would really rather read it as 1,492,000, but 1492,000. 19, well, I've got the one in the tens place, so how do I get the 10 for the 19? What symbol? X. And then what's my symbol symbols for 9? I, X. And these are not underneath the bar because they're not in the thousands place, right? They're after that vertical bar that I put in, separating these, these, these pieces out. Okay, are we okay? Ready to shift gears? All right, we're going to take a look at base 10 blocks. You have seen base 10 blocks somewhere before, I'm sure. We have some in here, I'm gonna get some out in a second. Okay, base 10 blocks come in different pieces. So the first one is actually this little tiny cube. Okay, it's a little bitty cube, almost looks like an individual Lego piece or something like that, little blocks. And so this is a unit and it looks like a tiny little square when we draw it, it's a unit. If you stick 10 of these units together into this piece right here, so it's 10 long, we call this a long. And when we're drawing it, we just draw it with a very long piece. We don't need to mark out the individual 10 units. That's sufficient. If you put 10 of these longs together, right, side by side, you end up creating this larger square piece. And this is called a flat. And we just represent it again as a large square like this. And then it's probably on the other side. Nope. You can see here. Okay, I'm not seeing it. But if you put 10 of these together, you know, box them up together, like, you know, 3D wise, right? If you put 10 of them together, you have what's ending up calling a block, okay? So imagine this square, this is the flat in three dimensions, and you'd have a block. And so the block looks like, when we draw it anyway, it looks like a three-dimensional version. And so we get three-dimensional versions when we do these sort of extension lines to them, something like this. This is not perfect by any means. Um, but it's, you know, visually fairly decent. Now, this is base 10. So what if... Instead of base 10, we had a number system that was base 3. Well, the little unit would look the same, exactly the same, no difference. But when you did a long, the long would not be quite as long, because the long is only 3 long. See that? So the long looks a little short. It's actually 3 units long. And if you stick 3 of these units next to each other, 
you get this picture. This is a flat. But it's not a 10 by 10 flat, it's a 3 by 3 flat, right? And if you stick three of these together, right, make it three-dimensional, you get the block. This is what I was trying to show you, but I can't find a big red block in there. This is a block. And not only this, but the continuation of this works too. If I stick three of these together, or if I stick 10 of those kind of blocks together, this is the visual that this particular manipulative set uses for three of these things stuck together. But what happens is you get multiples of things, right? So the first one in our base 10 system, the unit's worth one, and the long is worth 10. What is the flat worth? How many were in it? Nope, close, 10 by 10, 100. This is a 10 by 10. The block is a 10 by 10 by 10, which would end up making it a 1,000. So we have these powers of 10 going on. If we were using base three, we'd have powers of three going on. So whatever base value system we're in, we could draw this exact same picture. It just changes the dimensions of the picture, but the picture looks the same, just a slightly different size. Does that make sense? So with that idea, we're going to take a look at base 8 blocks. If you had base 8 blocks, take a minute and write down what you think a unit, a long, a flat, and a block would be worth. Here's my block, just so y'all see it. It was in a different spot. See? Big old giant red thing. How did I miss it? Okay, we'll start with the easy one, the unit. What do you think a unit is worth in base eight? Eight. Nope. One. It's one. The unit's always worth one, no matter what place value we're in. But the eight that you mentioned, Kaylee, would be our long. So the long would be worth eight. What would the flat be worth? Yeah, it's eight squared. Or 64. How about a block? Five, yeah, it's 8 cubed or 512. Okay, is that all right? We're in base 8, so it's powers of 8. Just like in base 10, we use powers of 10. So if we thought about manipulatives, if we had blocks and units and flats and longs and so forth to represent this base 8 number 237, what would we actually have? Well, we'd have two flats and three longs and seven units. Does everybody understand that piece first? Flats, longs, and units. That's what those numbers are representing within those, those locations. But what is a flat worth in base 8? What would we say? 64. 64. The flat was worth 8 squared, or the flat is worth 64. What was a long worth in base 8? 8. 8. It's the only way to write that one, so that's all I'll do. And then what's a unit worth in base 8? One. One. They're always worth one. So this problem becomes 264, sorry, 2 times 64, plus 3 times 8, plus 7. What is that total amount? What do you get? 159. 159. So this question that we just considered on Part B is equivalent to asking, and you will see this other question asked as well. What is 237, base 8, in base 10? So what you want to imagine you have is you have these manipulatives, these blocks and these flats and these longs and these units. And imagine them more like Legos, like my pieces that I showed you for base 3 and base 10 are stuck together, they cannot be removed. But imagine they were like Legos, where they're stuck together and they have the ability to be broken apart. Can you picture that? 
So you have two of these flats, and you're actually able to break them apart into their individual little pieces. Well, each of them was worth 64, so now I have a 64 block in tiny little pieces, and I have a 64 you know, flat in tiny little pieces. I got 64 times 64, I'm sorry, 64 plus 64 little bitty pieces, right, units. Same thing for my longs. A long is worth eight, and I've broken them apart. So now I have three of those longs broken apart. I have 24 little units. And then I had the seven units I already started with. And if I were to count all the little you know, pieces left over at the end, I'd have 159. That's what we're going to be doing um, with those kind of an ideas as we continue on in this section. But there's nothing special about eight, just like there's nothing special about three. And to be honest, there's nothing special about 10. It's simply the system we're familiar with because it's the one we use. So when we work with all of these, we work with them the same way. We just work with a different number based on the base that we're working with. So for example, we're going to look at three different bases, and these are sort of random, and there's nothing special about them, um, just like there's nothing special about eight or three. We are going to start with base three, and we're going to talk about units. So think about for a moment with me our base 10 system, which we started with at the very beginning of your lesson. If you flip back over to the very first page of what we did last class period, we wrote down symbols in the Hindu Arabic numeration system. We talked about the fact that we have 10 symbols, but it's not 1 through 10, it's 0 through 9, right? Do y'all remember that? 10 is a symbol in our system, but it's really two digits, right? So there's no single digit that is a 10. 10 is a two-digit number. So when we're working in different bases, the same is true. There's no 10 in base 10. There will be no 3 in base 3. There's no 8 in base 8, and there's no 12 in base 12. We have to stop one short. So if we're working with base 3, we have 0. We always start with 0. And then we have the number 1. And then we have the number 2. And we're in base 3, and that's three different symbols. So we have no more symbols in base 3. There's a zero, there's a one, and there's a two. There's no three in base three. So when we run out of symbols, what do we do? Well, think about in our system. What do you do when you run out of symbols? What happens when you get to nine? You just, add them. You just create two symbols, right? So you go from a one-digit number to a two-digit number. And we do the same thing in every base. When I run out of symbols, which I have run out of symbols at this point, I create a two-digit number, and the first two-digit number is always one, zero. And then after one, zero, we go to one, one. And then one, two, and then I can't go to one, three because there's no three. So what happens in our system when we run out of the two-digit number starting with one? When we get to one, nine, what do we do? Are you with me? We start with a two now, right? So we go on to two zero, and then the two one, and then the two two. And this two two that we just got is much like getting nine nine. What happens when we get nine nine in our system? What comes next? It should be a three digit number. What comes after 99? 100, a three-digit number, right? When I run out of two-digit numbers, I have to go to a three-digit number. And the process will continue. Okay, let's try another system, base seven. Base seven starts with zero, because they all do. But where will it stop? Six. And at that point, I've run out of digits in base 7. So what comes after 6? 1, 0. Nicely done on saying it is 1, 0. Resist the temptation to say 10. There's no 10s. That doesn't make sense in this system. It is 1, 0. What will come after 1, 0? Mm -hmm. 1, 1. And we would keep going until we got to 1, 6, where we would run out again, and we'd get 2, two 0. And we would continue this until we get, what's the biggest two-digit number in base 7?
What's the biggest one-digit number in base 7? 6. So 66, or 66, actually, would be the biggest two-digit number. All right, I can't get anything bigger because I don't have any symbols that will allow me to get bigger. So at that point was then I would go, is when I would go to a three-digit number. Okay, so it's almost like we just removed, we took our system, right? We took our system and we removed anything that has sixes, or I'm sorry, in this case, sevens and eights and nines. Yep, we just removed them all. We included only everything else that doesn't have sixes, sevens, I'm sorry, sevens, eights, and nines. We just eliminated those pieces. The base 12 isn't like that. What, what about base 12 makes it different than bases 3 and 7? It's already bigger, right? It's bigger than our base 10. So I can't just take some things out. Agreed? Mm -hmm. I have to actually put some things in. I need more symbols. So I have the symbols from one, one I'm sorry, from 0 to 9. But that's only 10 symbols, and I need 12 symbols. But I don't have any more numbers that I can put there that have a different meaning. Agreed? So different resources do different things. Um, if the contemporary math book they use, they use T is 10 and E is 11 and W is 12. That's what they use, kind of because you know the words themselves. Um, that's a little bit limiting. What do you do when you get bigger than 12? Now you've got 13. What do we use? H? What if we get to 14? We use an F? I mean, it's confusing because what letter do you use if you keep going in this route? Your book does something that's a little bit easier to work with, and they go through the alphabet starting with A. So the first number after 9 is the number, quote-unquote, A. So A is 10, and B is the number 11. And we could keep going then, right? You can get 26 more alphabet letters if you want to use all 26 of them to make a really big number system. We're going to write down a few more things about base 12, and then I want to talk about base systems because... Um, it feels like this is just playing games, but the reality is you use other base systems all the time, and some of these base systems some of the time, and you don't even really think about the fact that they are different base systems. So let's look at a couple more things. After B, because we've run out of digits, we would have the numbers 1, 0. What would be the biggest number that I would get to get 1 something? Like I'm going to have a 1, 9. What do you suppose comes after 1, 9? What's after 9? But in this system, what do we call it? A. So after 1, 9 is 1A. One That's simply the next symbol. What would be after 1A? 1B. And what's after 1B? Two zero. So what's the biggest two-digit number in base 12? Wait, how did you that? Because I ran out of numbers in the ones place. It goes like just like this. It's okay. 9AB. So 9AB, and I've run that. I've run out. So I have to go up to a two-digit number with a 2 at the beginning now. Yeah. What would the biggest two-digit number be in base 12? 9B. That's a big number, but there's one bigger. There's lots bigger, actually. What's the biggest? Huh? Would it be B? No? Nope. BB? BB. B is the biggest number. So if we duplicate it, it's going to be bigger than any of the others. BB. It's just like 9 is our biggest number, so 99 is going to be bigger than, say, 89, right? So the or 98. Most, the biggest number is always going to be like the one before is like 6, 6, yeah. Mm -hmm. like right. And then we run them out, and we end up with a number that's a three-digit number. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to finish this up next time. Um, I never finish Section 3.1. In fact, Dr. Marsh and I were talking about 3.1, and it always takes us two and a half days to do it, so this is not unexpected. There, there are a number of systems that you use every day that are not base 12. I mean, base 10 number systems. This was 12. Base 10 number systems. Can you think of any places where you see other base systems used? You cognizantly do it with a clock every day. You don't have any concerns about the fact that you exceed the number 9 and go to the numbers 10 and 11 and 12 on a clock, do you? 
I know we write them as two-digit numbers, but that's a base 12 system. After the number 12, it starts to repeat, right? Um, and within the clock, we also have the minutes, right? It doesn't bother us at all that we've exceeded nine minutes and we have 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 15 minutes. It's a base 60 system in our minutes and seconds. It's not represented like these things, but we use base 60 with our clock. We use base 12 with our clock. Every single one of us carries around a phone. My teenagers don't yet. My young teenagers, we don't let them. Your phone is on a base two number system. We haven't talked about base two, but base two has only ones and zeros. Computer programming is done as base two. Also, computer programming is sometimes done in a hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is base 16. All right, this is base 12. Base 16 is used in everyday numbers. And if you did not have thumbs, or maybe you were like the cartoon characters, like if you've ever seen the Flintstones, they all have three fingers and a thumb. Have you ever seen them? They always draw them this way. Three fingers and a thumb. So if you had four of them, right, if we all were born with four fingers, you know, three fingers and a thumb on each hand, we wouldn't use base 10. We'd be using base eight. Yeah, because we'd have eight fingers. We use base 10 because we have 10 fingers. That's where it came from. It's not like it just appeared out of nowhere. It's all based on the way that God created our bodies and how people have developed based on his creation. So as you're working through this and you're thinking again, remember two things. Number one, you do have these systems in your, you know, in your everyday life all the time. But also remember that part of the problems in this section are intended to make you feel a little uncomfortable to put yourself in the position of your students. And that's a good thing, even if it's not a comfortable thing. Okay? We will finish this up on Monday.